Chapter 6 Mental Block When you make a complete change in your mode of living, as I did, you learn that, along with the strange aspects of the new life which seep in and become part of you, will come others to which you never become accustomed. Some of the things I never got used to were the hen, the gasoline lantern, the outhouse at night where I had a horrible choice of either sitting in the dark and not knowing what was crawling on me or bringing a lantern and attracting moths, mosquitoes, nighthawks, and bats. No radio. No telephone. Bats hanging upside down in the cellar, flying in the open bedroom windows on summer nights, swooping low over the bed, almost touching my face and making my skin undulate in horror. Dropping boards and chicken lice. The inconsistency of a mother nature who made winter so wetly, coldly, soggily miserable that I wanted to get back under my stone and spring so warm, so lush and fragrant that I wanted to roll on my back and whiny. Rhododendrons being wild. Rhododendrons are expensive shrubs usually grouped in bad color combinations in front of white houses. The ugly purple ones are often banked in front of mustard stucco houses. That is all I knew about the rhododendron until I moved to the mountains. Then I learned that the rhododendron is the native flower of the state of Washington, and in the spring and early summer, every roadside, every mountainside, every woodsy place on the coast is ablaze with them. They are all pink, but range from deep cherise buds to pale pink full-blown blossoms. In the open fields around Docktown Bay, the bushes were about four feet high, rounded in the orthodox bush shape, and solid with blooms. The flower heads as big as cabbages. The individual flowerets like single roses. The shiny dark green foliage, like laurel, was beautiful in its own right. In the thickets and in the woods, the long slender rhododendron branches reached as high as 20 feet in an effort to find light and sun, and as they bore their flowers on the uppermost tips of these branches, it was no surprise to walk through the woods, look up and see a lovely cerise bud peering down from the top branches of a small fir or with flushed cheek laid on the cool, oily smoothness of a cedar frond. The rhododendrons were so gorgeous, so showy. It was hard for me to believe that they were wildflowers. And as I climbed into trees and scrambled over stumps to get a wonderful armful of buds, I guiltily looked for no trespassing signs. There's a law that they cannot be picked within 50 feet of the highway, but no one should object to that, as they are far prettier and deeper colored back in the woods. Rhododendrons grow profusely all over the mountains near our ranch, but there were none in the ranch yard, so I asked the man at the feed and seed store in town how to transplant them. He said to transplant them while they were in bloom and be sure to put them in a shady place where the soil was damp and acid. What he did not tell me was that they have a top root as big as my arm and about a mile long. Armed with my spading fork and a desire to fill up an ugly corner by the back porch where the soil was so sour it grew only moss, I went out one warm spring evening and found myself three stockily well-formed plants just coming into bloom. I confidently thrust the fork into the soil, making a circle around the base so that there would be a ball of earth on the roots. When everything was well loosened, I slipped the fork under the roots, grabbed the main stalk, and nothing happened. The thing wasn't even budgeable. I dug deeper and pried harder and finally located the tap root, which went straight down into the bowels of the earth then took a sharp turn and headed north for a mile or so. With night upon me and the realization that I was going to have to tunnel under the road staring me in the face, I went home and got the hatchet and chopped off the tap root about a foot from the main stem. The next two I chopped before even digging and stuffed them all into a pit I had previously dug by the porch. They not only lived, they throve. The astonishing fact that there was always on my pantry shelf a water bucket of double yoked and checked eggs to do with as I would as a source of constant delight 
and lured me into trying many of the rich, eggy, old-fashioned recipes in Mrs. Lincoln's cookbook. In town where I would have had to buy my groceries and balance a food budget, I would have put up with Mrs. Lincoln and her, quote, beat the whites of 16 large eggs with a fork on a platter, end quote, and her, quote, two wine glasses of old brandy and a cup of sliver blanched almonds, end quote, for two minutes. Mrs. Lincoln was the type who couldn't cook oatmeal mush without adding a flagon of cherry flip or a soup son of betel nuts. I would have loved to visit Mrs. Lincoln, but she was held to cook for her, unless you lived on a chicken ranch and then you and Mrs. Lincoln could see eye to eye about a lot of things, particularly eggs. I had already made sunshine cake, angel food, and pound cake and was wondering what would be good on a rainy, wet winter day when I chanced on cream puffs. Now there is something, I said, for cream puffs were an old favorite of mine, and they use lots of eggs. The recipe called for, quote, eight eggs to be broken one by one and beaten into the mixture with the bare right hand, end quote. Now, Mrs. Lincoln, let's not be frugal, I said, and use 16 eggs. This made gallons of dough and almost broke my arm, but if Mrs. Lincoln could do it at her age, so can I. Quote, put pieces of dough the size of walnuts in the pan, leaving plenty of room as they will puff to the size of large apples, end quote. I did, but when I took them out of the oven, they were still the size of walnuts, but hard as diamonds. Down, but not out, I got up my deep fat kettle. When the fat was smoking hot, I dropped in a piece of dough. Poof! The little thing swelled to the size of a cantaloupe. I was ecstatic. For hours, I dropped little walnuts into the fat and pulled out great golden puffs. Then, sweating but happy, I whipped a large bowl of canned milk. We'll each fix our own, I said proudly to Bob as I put them on the dinner table and hurried back for the canned milk. I cut mine open to put in the filling, but it was already filled filled with cold grease. They all were, and not only that, but whipped canned milk. In case you didn't know, tastes exactly as burning rubber smells. I never became acclimated to discuss of wire worms, intestines, chicken lice, ad nauseum at the breakfast table. I used to think that Bob's finer feelings would make a good emery bag as I watched him closely examine a colored diagram of a chicken's wormy insides, then with relish take a spoonful of soft boiled egg back to the diagram, then to the egg. I would nervously sip my coffee and try to concentrate on last week's paper. Even when I was clear and away from the kitchen and feeling in first class shape, not pregnant, in order to take care of the various ills of or to perform a post-mortem on a chicken, I would have to say over and over, this is just like being a doctor. This is just like being a doctor. And sometimes I was sick and sometimes I was not. But it took me several days to get back to eggs again. Bob said that it was in the mind, but I reminded him that cleaning fish made him sick and I had to take the dead rats out of the attic. There is no explaining those things. A large husky Swedish farmer down the valley was known to be the best butcher in the country. One day during the fall, Bob went down to see him about butchering our pigs. Mr. Larson was in the barnyard, and while Bob talked to him, he knocked on the head, slit the throats, and eviscerated two calves without twitching a muscle. But when his wife cut her hand on the separator a few minutes later, Bob had to stop the flow of blood and bandage it while Mr. Larson turned green. Mopping his moist forehead, with a handkerchief held by a hand and arm, red to the elbow with calf's blood, Mr. Larson said, Blood always did make me sick. I found it impossible to remember that almost everyone was part Indian. I commented on this to a tall blonde woman named Selma Johnson, whom we picked up on the road one day and drove to the Docktown store. She laughed heartily and said, Don't let it bother you. Now I'm one third bow and arrow myself. Dad's a Swede and Mom's an Indian. Now I look like a Swede 
And my older sister looks like Pocahontas. The only thing I inherited from mom was good teeth. All us Indians got good teeth. She laughed again, exposing her milk white perfect teeth. I learned that first year that I must not be embarrassed or incensed at the most personal questions. In a country where breeding fertility and birth were of prime importance in livestock and were discussed casually all the time, it stood to reason that breeding, fertility, and birth in humans, though not so important, would be discussed as casually. I turned crimson the first time a farmer, almost a total stranger to me, leaned across the supper table and said to his wife, Vera, tell Betty about the time you miscarried when we had the preacher to supper. I grew used to it, though, as I grew used to all the food being boiled in the homes of illegitimate sons, of the illegitimate sons, of the illegitimate sons, dotted over the countryside like naturalized bulbs. The legitimate and otherwise gathered together for holidays and anniversaries, and no one seemed ashamed of his relationship. There is no use crying over spilt milk, we of the mountains said. Pregnancy was referred to as being, quote, that way. My being, quote, that way, end quote, went the rounds of the mountains and valleys, along with the news about the contagious abortion in the Hellwig herd of Jersey's and the impotency of the Green Bull. One day when Bob and I were driving to town, a man hailed us. We stopped and he climbed on the running board and leaned into the car confidentially. Say, he said, heard you was that way. Yes, I said, I am. The man leaned in farther so that his face was uncomfortably close to mine. Just say the word and I'll fix you up. Drop up some evening with six dollars and I'll fix you good as new. Not a thing to it, he said, winking at Bob. Took care of Mrs. Smith when she was six months along and got rid of three for my own wife at three months. Just a plain old-fashioned button hook, nothing to it. Oh, him, said the girl in the doctor's office. His wife's in the hospital right now, recovering from her last abortion. We get his work in here all the time, and she laughed heartily. I didn't think it was funny. Why don't they stop him? Why don't they arrest him? The girl sighed and looked out the window. If it wasn't him, it would be someone else. If they can't find someone else to do it, they abort themselves. The hospital's full of them all the time. Button hooks, bailing wire, hat pins. God, they're dumb. Not dumb, pitifully ignorant. I put up my Christmas tree during the last week of November just to get the feel and smell of November out of the house. Bob warned me that it would dry out the needles and would fall off before Christmas, but I laughed. Not only did I think the drying out improbable, but it seemed more likely that it would flourish and give birth to little Christmas trees in the moist atmosphere of the house. I never tired of admiring and loving our little Christmas trees. When we cleared the back fields, Bob let me keep about ten of the prettiest trees for future Christmas trees. The loveliest of all we sent home to the family, but the one I chose for our first Christmas was a dear, fat little lady with her full green skirts hiding her feet and all of her branches tipped with cones. During the summer and fall, I used to go out and stroke and smell my little tree, and it made me feel guilty to look around at her little brothers and sisters crowding the fence and peering wistfully into the yard. Clearing land there in the mountains was like holding back a mob at a fire. As long as the fences held and we were ever watchful, we were safe enough. But one break and the trees surged in. We were constantly pushing them back from the garden, the road, the driveway, the chicken yard. And the mountains were carelessly letting them slide down on us. I expected to look up some day and see a mountain bear shouldered and grabbing frantically for her trees. The family implored us to spend Christmas with them, but we couldn't leave the chickens, and so they sent lavish boxes, and we retaliated with Sears, Roebuck, quote, multicolored, unquote, and, quote, floral backgrounds, end quote. It rained on Christmas, and it differed from other winter days, only in that stove balked and refused to have anything to do with the 22-pound turkey Bob had bought 
and so we had dinner at 10.30 at night instead of 5. Christmas is best with a large family, I found. After Christmas, it rained and rained and rained, and dusk settled like a shroud a little after 3 o'clock. From the forlorn greenness of the burn would come the sharp crack of a falling snag. Even when there wasn't a breach of wind, the poor old things would release their grip on the earth and fall with a splintering crash. The burn, no, always as the big burn, extended from our road to an arm of the sea about 50 miles away. It was about five miles wide, but gradually grew narrower as the mountains did their best to draw the trees together over this unsightly rip, which showed their bare skin through the green. Years ago, fire had swept up this great ravine and was evidently finally checked by the stream whose dry bed was our rose. Like a pestilence struck village, the burn was covered with the gaunt, dying bodies of the sick, the falling, rotting bodies of the dead. And over everything crawled the marauding blackberry vines, nettles, and fireweed. A few low-class squatters like alder, salal, wild raspberry, and blackcaps had made some half-hearted attempts at reclamation, but only in the earliest spring were these even noticeable. For some strange reason, it was fine hunting ground for birds, rabbits, and deer. I hated the burn. In summer, it was parched and dry and ugly, and in winter, it was gray and soggy and ugly. Mists haunted it day and night, and winds came roaring up its entire length and crashed headlong into the house or came crawling from under the vines and logs on their bellies up through the orchard to snivel and whine at the doors and windows. The skyline of the burn was so black and hopeless, it made me want to run home, light all the lamps, and huddle by stove. In summer, the orchard and the alders and maples across the road hid it from the house, but on gray winter days, its snaggletooth horizon could be seen plainly. Some winter days, great winds came bounding down out of the north, blew rain at us in spitty gusts sent the mountains misty veils flying, exposing their pale, haughty faces, crashed around on the burn, snapping giant snags and tossing terrible handfuls of limbs just everywhere, grabbed our house by the scruff of its neck and shook it until the windows rattled and shaked and flew off, sniffed around the eaves of the chicken house, hoping for a loose board, then dashed back to annoy the mountains again, prostrating the small trees in its path. It was boisterous and noisy and terrifying. The only redeeming factor of this terrible wind was that it reached down the chimney, yanked the smoke out, and made stove roar and crackle in spite of himself. On stormy days, I lit the lamps early and stayed close to the house and stove. Bob seemed oblivious of the weather. Apparently lulled by the screaming wind, the falling trees, the lashing rain, he whistled gaily as he pumped up his lanterns and began his evening chores. Bundled in oilskins, lanterns, and swinging like beacons, feed buckets clanking cheerfully, he walked briskly through the rain. He never even noticed the terrible nearness of the mountains.